Welcome back, my dear friends. In the following tapes, we'll dive into the secrets lurking beneath the surface of a seemingly innocent place. Today, we embark on an investigation that takes us into the heart of childhood wonder and cheesy delights, Chuck E. Cheese. Picture this, a delightful pizza joint where kids run wild and animatronic animals serenade them with tunes of joy. Ah, the magical land of animatronic creatures and an endless supply of pizza. But behind the laughter and the cheesy goodness, darkness can sometimes rear its head, reminding us that even in the happiest of places, tragedies can unfold. Now let me set the stage for our investigation. On a fateful night in December 1993, chaos descended upon a Chuck E. Cheese in Aurora, Colorado. As the nighttime crew prepared to close shop, little did they know that their world was about to be shattered, leaving an indelible mark on the city and its people. So join me as we uncover the secrets of Chuck E. Cheese where childhood dreams meet the chilling unknown. Imagine, if you will, a world before the internet became the all-encompassing force that binds us together today. A time when phone calls were made on landlines and letters were the vessels that carried our thoughts across the miles. It was an era when time moved a bit slower, allowing for deeper connections and moments of contemplation amidst the humdrum of daily existence. The air was filled with the melodies of iconic songs that still echo in our hearts today. Grunge music swept through the nation, speaking to the souls of a disenchanted youth. Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and Soundgarden painted the emotional landscape with their raw lyrics and haunting melodies, giving voice to a generation yearning for something real. In the realm of cinema, the silver screen came alive with unforgettable stories. From the magical streets of a town called Halloween, where the Pumpkin King yearned for something more, to the heartwarming tale of a young dinosaur forging an unlikely friendship, 1993 birthed cinematic masterpieces that ignited our imaginations and touched our hearts. The world watched in awe as the Hubble Space Telescope captured breathtaking images from the depths of the universe, unveiling galaxies that seemed to stretch into eternity. Yet, amidst the beauty and splendor, shadows cast their long reach across the tapestry of 1993. The world was not without its share of sorrow and upheaval. My friends, we embark on a journey through the corridors of Aurora, Colorado in the year 1993. In 1993, Aurora, Colorado had an approximate population of 236,734 inhabitants, and it was a patchwork of diverse communities, a tapestry woven with threads of resilience and unity. It stood proudly, a city embracing both progress and the quiet charms of a close-knit community. A sense of belonging hung in the air as neighbors shared smiles and nodded in recognition fostering a spirit of camaraderie that brought solace in the face of an ever-changing world. Aurora's neighborhoods, lined with stately trees and picturesque houses, formed the backdrop for stories of families, dreams, and aspirations. Children's laughter danced through the streets. It was a city where the simplicity of a backyard barbecue or an evening stroll held the power to weave memories that would endure for a lifetime. Ah, the haunting hour of 9 p.m. on December 14, 1993, where destiny would unfold its merciless hand and etch an indelible mark. This tragic event, shrouded in sorrow, would cast its haunting shadow, forever lingering in the depths of Aurora. At the center of our investigation, we find Nathan Dunlap. His story begins with a troubled household. Born on April 8, 1974, his mother, Carol Dunlap, grappled with bipolar disorder. Her erratic behavior haunted the lives of Nathan and his siblings, Picture this, Carol, in the dead of night, berating her children while roaming the house in a state of undress. Obsessive cleaning sprees, furniture moving, and excessive bathing became her norms. She even threw Nathan into the trash when he was just an infant. Carol's aggression extended to Nathan's younger brother, Garland, and she openly expressed her hatred for her daughter, Ardenia. But Carol wasn't the sole source of torment in their lives. Nathan's stepfather, Jerry Dunlap, a 400-pound Baptist minister, added to their misery. Physical and mental abuse became the siblings' grim reality. Nathan himself witnessed Jerry's brutal actions towards his sister, Ardenia. The atmosphere grew darker with each passing day. Nathan's descent into darkness began in middle school. Depression consumed him, leading to two suicide attempts by the age of 14. 
Despite Jerry's request for a psychological evaluation, no significant action was taken. Nathan's high school years saw him engaged in armed robberies using golf clubs and firearms. He ended up in a juvenile detention center, later transferring to a psychiatric hospital due to an episode. Then, Dunlap found employment at the very restaurant that would come to bear witness to the unfolding tragedy. The same year he left the psychiatric hospital, he found work at a Chuck E. Cheese, but was later fired after a disagreement with his supervisor over the schedule. The termination left him frustrated, and he expressed a desire to seek revenge. And so, my dear friend, we find ourselves at the precipice of destiny, where the threads of Nathan Gerard Dunlap's life intertwine with a fateful night that looms on the horizon. As the clock ticks, we stand poised on the edge of revelations, ready to uncover the layers of a tale that will forever reverberate in the echoes of time. As night cast its gloomy veil over the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant, Nathan Dunlap stepped into its fluorescent lit embrace. Hunger gnawed at his insides, leading him to order a humble ham and cheese sandwich. But beneath his calm demeanor, a storm brewed, hiding his true intentions from unsuspecting eyes. At approximately 9.50 p.m., Dunlap sought refuge in the solitude of the restroom. Minutes turned into a waiting game, and then, as the clock ticked past 10.05 p.m., the restaurant closed its doors. Emerging from his hiding place, Dunlap unleashed a chilling symphony of destruction upon the unsuspecting employees. Sylvia Crowell, just 19 years old, her hands diligently wiping the salad bar, became the first victim. From close range, a bullet found its mark, piercing her right ear, leaving her mortally wounded. Ben Grant, 17, oblivious to the lurking danger, fell victim to a fatal shot near his left eye. The innocence of his vacuuming routine shattered in an instant. Colleen O'Connor, 17, her pleas for mercy echoing through the air, sank to her knees in a desperate bid for survival but Dunlap's heart knew no compassion. One shot through the top of her head sealed her tragic fate, extinguishing any flicker of hope. Amidst this chaos, Bobby Stevens, 20, unknowingly returned from his smoke break, believing the sounds from within the restaurant were innocent children at play. As he entered, the menacing figure of Dunlap materialized, raising a handgun with deadly intent. A shot found its mark, striking Stevens in the jaw, sending him crashing to the floor. Playing dead became his only solace, his last threat of survival. Dunlap's dark dance led him to Marge Kohlberg, 50, the store manager. With menace in his eyes, he forced her to unlock the safe, her life hanging in the balance. Compliance did not guarantee reprieve. A shot pierced her ear, a cruel reminder of Dunlap's merciless nature. And when he spied the slightest movement, he sealed her fate with a second shot through her other ear. In the aftermath of this calculated chaos, Stevens, wounded but resolute, seized an opportunity to escape through a back door. Finding solace in the nearby Mill Pond apartment complex, he pounded on a door, a beacon of hope amidst the darkness, desperately seeking aid for himself and his fallen comrades. As authorities arrived, they were met with a chilling scene of sorrow. Two lifeless bodies graced the restaurant's hallway, another lay hidden in a nearby room, and the fourth, a beacon of authority, found her final resting place in the manager's office. Crowell, though her spirit clung to life, her brain betrayed her, leaving her declared brain dead. Dunlap, consumed by his vile deeds, fled the scene, clutching onto stolen treasures. $1,500 worth of cash and game tokens served as meager spoils of his rampage. But fate had other plans. Twelve hours later, the long arm of justice reached out, clasping Dunlap within the confines of his mother's apartment. In the aftermath of that harrowing night, Nathan Dunlap sought solace in the company of his trusted confidant, Carl Wilson. Money counted, alibis sought, and the tale unfolded. Meanwhile, Tracy, his girlfriend, provided a testament to his whereabouts, claiming he had called her from the very Chuck E. Cheese he had been dismissed from, engaging in video game arcades. The winds of news carried whispers to Nathan's mother, Carol, who rushed to the scene with a flurry of concerned parents. Unaware of her own son's involvement, she found herself comforting Colleen O'Connor's grieving mother. The irony of the situation eluded her completely. It was Bobby, the lone survivor, who held the key to the truth. His words pointed directly at Nathan Dunlap, leaving no room for doubt. And so, the dance of justice began. The investigators approached Carol Dunlap, 
her heart refusing to accept the notion that her son could be responsible for such an atrocity. Fueled by the belief in her son's innocence, she reached out, paging him urgently, demanding his presence. Nathan, however, dallied, tending to his hands with peroxide and cleansing himself with a shower. In a plea for assistance, he entrusted Tracy with the task of hiding his clothes and the gun, concealed behind her grandparents' shed. To secure his secret further, Nathan stashed a substantial sum of money beneath the freezer's cool embrace. With his affairs in order, he departed Tracy's dwelling, heading back to his own house, where the police awaited his arrival. Questioning, swabbing for gunshot residue, and seizing his garments as evidence became the order of the day. But Nathan, ever evasive, left his house early the following morning, seeking refuge in the abode of another acquaintance, Charles Waters. It was there, amidst the whispers and revelations, that Nathan Dunlap's true nature found voice. As Charles unveiled the unfolding events at the local Chuck E. Cheese, Nathan's chilling response echoed through the air, confessing to the deeds that stained that tragic night. In the realm of justice, the story of Nathan Gerard Dunlap takes a haunting turn. Found guilty of heinous crimes, he faced a sentence of four counts of first-degree murder, attempted murder, robbery, and burglary in 1996. The weight of his actions led to a death sentence and an additional 108 years behind bars. During the sentencing, an outburst consumed him with a flurry of oaths and protests that echoed for three long minutes. Years later, in 2008, Dunlap sought a glimmer of hope through a habeas corpus petition. He claimed his trial attorney had failed him by neglecting to present his mental health struggles and history of child abuse as a defense. However, his appeal met a firm rejection in August 2010. The ruling acknowledged a fair trial, competent representation, and a justifiable sentence of death. As the wheels of justice turned, Dunlap's fate faced further scrutiny. In 2012, an appeal of his death sentence was denied by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. His lawyers argued that his mental illness should have been presented as evidence during the sentencing phase, potentially sparing him from the ultimate penalty. Yet, their pleas fell on deaf ears. The clock ticked forward, and an execution date loomed. On May 1, 2013, Judge William Sylvester announced that mid-August of that year would mark the end of Dunlap's journey. But fate, it seems, had different plans. Just days later, Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper intervened, signing a temporary reprieve that spared Dunlap from the gallows. The reprieve ensured that as long as Hickenlooper held power, Dunlap's execution would be indefinitely suspended. It was a decision that carried weight, drawing attention and debate from various groups, including the NAACP, who raised concerns about the disparities of the death penalty among different races. The reprieve remained in place until a new governor could review the case and decide its ultimate course. Change arrived on November 6, 2018, with Jared Paulus assuming the mantle of governor. During his campaign, Paulus expressed intentions to repeal the death penalty in Colorado. As for the Dunlap case, he wisely chose not to comment before reviewing the specifics and making an informed decision befitting the weight of his office. Finally, on March 23, 2020, the ink of change was etched upon the pages of law. Paulus signed a bill repealing the death penalty in Colorado, forever altering the landscape of justice. In this transformation, the sentences for all three men on death row, including Dunlap, were commuted to life without parole. A new chapter began, and Dunlap found himself imprisoned at the Colorado State Penitentiary in Cannon City, where he remains to this day. Let's now remember the four victims of this tragedy. Colleen O'Connor, a spirited 17-year-old senior at Eagle Crest High, possessed a drive for excellence. Juggling eight classes and participating in an elementary school tutoring program, she aimed for her best grades yet. Recently, she had embraced vegetarianism, recognizing the wrongness of consuming lifeless animals. Colleen was known among her peers as fun, likable, and popular, always ready with an engaging story. Her academic progress remained commendable, even after transferring briefly to George Washington High before returning to Eagle Crest. Benjamin Grant, a junior at Smoky Hill High, exuded warmth and camaraderie, earning the admiration of all who crossed his path. Besides being a diligent student, he wrestled and had recently embarked on his employment journey at Chuck E. Cheese. Benjamin's connection to the school ran deep, 
with his younger sister currently attending and his older brother graduating just the year before. Sylvia Kathleen Crowell, a 19-year-old student at Metropolitan State College, immersed herself in her work at Chuck E. Cheese, dedicating her full-time efforts for two months. Described by her brother as friendly and selfless, Sylvia had a natural inclination to put others' needs before her own. Gateway High recognized her as a diligent student who consistently worked hard and radiated positivity. Known for her unwavering support and listening ear, Sylvia's friends found solace in her uplifting presence. Margaret E. Kohlberg, a manager at Chuck E. Cheese, had recently relocated to Colorado with her husband, seeking refuge from the violence that had plagued their former California home. A move towards a simpler life led them to a new home in Parker. Margaret, a mother of two daughters, cherished her commitment to physical fitness and outdoor activities. Walking, cycling, and cross-country skiing brought her joy, reflecting her dedication to well-being. Colleagues described Margaret as a sweet soul, and her presence had quickly become a cherished part of the workplace community. Finally, Bobby Stevens, the courageous survivor of the harrowing 1993 mass shooting, finds himself wearied by the constant retelling of the tragic events that forever altered his life. Each time he is asked to recount the horrors he endured, it feels as if wounds long ago stitched are mercilessly ripped open once more. In a fateful encounter, Nathan Dunlap fired upon Bobby Stevens, leaving him wounded and bleeding but miraculously alive. Bobby lay there, a silent witness to the unfolding chaos until the ordeal had concluded. Justice was served, as Dunlap was convicted and sentenced to death for his heinous crimes. Yet on May 22, 2013, news arrived that Dunlap's execution would be delayed, courtesy of a temporary reprieve granted by Governor John Hickenlooper. This unexpected announcement blindsided Bobby Stevens, leaving him feeling deceived by what he perceived as covert clemency. Bobby remained resolute in his determination to see justice served and vows to carry forward his campaign for Nathan Dunlap's execution, placing his trust in Colorado's next governor. On March 23, 2020, Colorado Governor Jared Polis signed a bill to repeal the state's death penalty and commuted the sentences of the three men on the state's death row to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Dunlap was one of those three. No punishment for offender 89148, death or life imprisonment without possibility of parole, can bring back the victims or lessen the pain and heartache he has caused, Paulus said in the executive order. My decision today is not a commentary on the moral or ethical implications of the death penalty in our society. Rather, it is a reflection of current law in Colorado, where the death penalty has been abolished. In the midst of this complex tapestry of emotions, Bobby Stevens stands as a reminder of the indomitable human spirit, resilient in the face of tragedy, and unwavering in his pursuit of justice. And so, dear listeners, we reach the conclusion of this haunting case that has woven its tendrils into the fabric of our consciousness. As we bid farewell to the stories of those involved, we are reminded of the enduring power of resilience and the quest for justice that burns brightly within the human spirit. The tale of Nathan Dunlap, Bobby Stevens, and the lives forever altered on that fateful day will forever linger in our minds a reminder of the fragility of existence and the depths of both darkness and light that dwell within us all. As the night grows deeper and the shadows lengthen, it is time to bid you adieu and retire to the realms of slumber. Rest assured, dear listeners, that the pursuit of truth and justice continues. May your dreams be filled with visions of hope and resolution, and may the morning bring with it a renewed sense of purpose and the promise of a brighter day. Until we meet again, in the corridors of mystery and the depths of the unknown, sleep well and embrace the mysteries that lie ahead. Good night, dear listeners.